gentlemen, uh, esteemed participants. Um, I'm honoured to be uh, uh, to be invited to speak at this CEP event uh, as as coordinator of the uh, ISIL and Al Qaeda and Taliban monitoring team. Um, let me just very briefly introduce the team itself. It supports the so-called 1267 and 1988 sanctions committees, and it's also responsible within the UN for assessing the global threat posed by ISIL and Al Qaeda. Um, our biannual reports on these groups and our annual reports on the Taliban are available online, so very easily accessed if you would like to look at them. Um, the monitoring team uh, as a UN counterterrorism global compact entity works closely with the UN Office of Counterterrorism and with the Counterterrorism Executive Directorate and the full range of other entities uh, that contribute to the wider counterterrorist activities of the United Nations. Um, despite the operational challenges of the pandemic, uh, we are working to increase that cooperation and to contribute our expertise uh, in a range of fora. Turning specifically to Afghanistan, obviously I've been invited here to speak about the threat landscape, uh, how, how the many terror groups uh, present, uh, present that threat uh, and, 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 and how the, the Taliban and those groups interact with one another uh, and the complexity of that picture, as Hans has already hinted, is, is, is considerable. Uh, and then of course, this very interesting question of how uh, the dynamics of the peace process impact on all of that. Um, as you will know, of course, multiple rounds of talks carried out over more than a year produced an agreement signed by the Taliban and the United States on 29th of February uh, 2020 in Doha, Qatar, uh, where, where indeed, of course, six months later, uh, intra-Afghan talks got underway with some, uh, some difficulty. Um, the agreement provided for the United States military drawdown in exchange for steps taken by the Taliban to counter terrorism prisoner exchanges between the Afghan government and the Taliban, and also uh, the removal of sanctions and the launch of these intra-Afghan talks aiming to uh, produce a permanent ceasefire. Now, of course, these were challenging aims. Um, whilst the Taliban remains internally disciplined uh, enough to be a formidable fighting force, uh, there are divisions within it which make compromise with its adversaries difficult and its messaging remains hardline and has remained so uh, consistently uh, during the talks and since the talks. Um, the group also appears well prepared to continue fighting uh, and it's raised the tempo of its attacks on Afghan government targets whilst trying to avoid provoking the United States. Now interpretations of the agreement differ and that slowed progress in its implementation. Further periodic crises I think are to be expected. Hardline Taliban certainly still uh, believe that they could achieve their aims by force. The agreement doesn't address the point that Hans made about the sort of war economy, the, uh, the, 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 the money dimension of this, the, uh, the uh, industrialization of criminality that, that occurs in conflicts. Um, and of course, ta the Taliban's ongoing generation of revenue from narcotics is a, is a major issue and will be a, a challenge under any future arrangements for governance in Afghanistan. The serious problem of the poppy-related industry is now overla overlaid with methamphetamine production and trafficking. And I mention this point because in any peace process, those who have benefited most from a conflict economy, gaining wealth, power, respect, um, they will have reservations about embracing a new world of order, regulation and responsibility. Uh, but it is unthinkable that Afghanistan can flourish at home and abroad without addressing the narcotic challenge and ceasing to be the world's largest source of illegal heroin. Turning to uh, Al Qaeda specifically, uh, senior figures remain in Afghanistan, as well as hundreds of armed operatives. Um, the franchise of Al Qaeda in, in the Indian subcontinent is present, uh, and also groups of foreign terrorist fighters aligned with the Taliban. Ayman al Zawahri himself remains close to the Taliban and is usually assessed to reside in Afghanistan or in the Afghan Pakistan border region. A number of significant Al-Qaeda Al figures have been killed in Afghanistan during 2000 and 2019 and 2020. 
Um, I'll just quote something that the monitoring team said in a previous report, because I think it's useful um, just as a, as, a, as a sort of a benchmark from, uh, from April 2019 in our 10th report uh, to the 1988 committee. And this was about foreign terrorist fighters in Afghanistan. Uh, and we said, Afghan officials have stated that over 20 regional and international terrorist groups are currently fighting against government forces in Afghanistan, mainly in the border areas. These groups include those listed under the ISIL and Al-Qaeda sanctions list. With the exception of ISIL, these groups are broadly aligned with the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Member state estimates of foreign terrorist fighters present in Afghanistan range between 8,000 and 10,000, similar to previous numbers reported to the monitoring team. Now, I, it's worth quoting that because, of course, the situation has evolved somewhat since then, but I think that makes a reasonable starting point. Um, one of the things that we uh, mentioned in our subsequent report, uh, the 11th report that was published this year, um, was that there were uh, probably six to 6,500 Pakistani foreign terrorist fighters in total in the whole of Afghanistan in April 2020. And that then leaves, obviously, going back to the previous figures, uh, a couple of thousand uh, non-Pakistani foreign terrorist fighters uh, distributed in their broad alignment between ISIL, Khorasan and Taliban Al-Qaeda alignment. Um, so there's a large number of foreign terrorist fighters, including non-Pakistanis, broadly aligned with the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Uh, whilst, of course, uh, the Taliban publicly um, insist that there are, there are no foreign terrorist fighters present under their umbrella. And that sort of, that denial of something that is a, a universally accepted fact uh, is, uh, is, is problematic because, of course, um, it, we're looking to the Taliban to take actions on the basis of something that at the moment they, they continue to insist is untrue. Um, even if we assume that a significant number of these foreign terrorist fighters are lying low with private sympathies for ISIL, and are candidates for absorption into ISIL under various peace process scenarios, we still have a large number firmly aligned with the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And this is a constituency that has no vested interest in peace in Afghanistan, rather the reverse, in fact. Um, even if they don't currently have plans to project an external terrorist threat, uh, at minimum, foreign extremists benefit from the continuing security vacuum and the, black, and the black economy in Afghanistan. Also, they have nowhere to go. Most of the Pakistani, most of them of Pakistani origin are enemies of Pakistan, of course. Um, they cannot safely return there. Uh, and those of Central Asian origin cannot go back to Central Asia or Russia uh, or easily to Syria, uh, or indeed in large numbers to other classic diaspora locations like Turkey, for example. Relations between the Taliban and especially the Haqqani network and Al Qaeda remain close, based on a history of shared struggle, intermarriage, and ideological kinship. The Taliban regularly consulted with Al-Qaeda during the negotiations with the United States, and they offered informal guarantees that, that they would honor their historic ties with Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda has reacted positively, in fact, in, in public to the agreement uh, with the United States, with statements from its acolytes celebrating it as a victory for the Taliban's cause, and thus for global militancy. The challenge will be to secure the counterterrorism gains to which the Taliban has committed, which will require them, among other things, to prevent Al Qaeda from posing any international threat from Afghanistan. Let me um, turn briefly to ISIL specifically. So ISIL's affiliate in Afghanistan and South Asia, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, uh, Khorasan province, uh, or ISIL-K, um, has suffered severe setbacks over the past year. It was almost eradicated from its main Afghan base in Nangarhar province in November 2019. And then it incurred further losses in its new refuge in neighboring Kunar province in early 2020. Taliban forces, as well as Afghan government forces and their international allies, played a significant part in these ISIL-K defeats. And this trajectory and the Taliban's role in it goes back to the eradication of a renegade Tal Taliban group in Jaujjan in summer 2018. Kari Hekmat's mainly ethnic Uzbek followers had hoisted the ISIL flag and so mounted a challenge that the Taliban could not tolerate. They were also shrewd enough, the Taliban were also shrewd enough to recognize that confronting the group could be spun as evidence that the Taliban could become a partner in counter-terrorism. Uh, and, and certainly the Taliban's um, 
uh, understanding of how to make the best PR uh, use of, the, of, of these of these striking successes that it has had against ISIL-K um, has been uh, has been interesting. You know, there's no there's no doubt that they understand the message that that sends uh, about potential future partnership. The monitoring team now estimates ISIL-K numbers uh, as possibly being below 2,200 in the whole of Afghanistan, but the group remains capable of mounting significant attacks uh, in various parts of the country, including in Kabul. Some which it is claimed have been facilitated by tactical accommodation with the Haqqani network to some degree. Uh, you may well ask how the Taliban can be fighting ISIL-K on one hand, while the Haqqani component of the Taliban cooperates with it. The point is the complexity of this multipolar conflict, where the Taliban benefits from anything that weakens the government. Haqqani activity is deniable, and they have the latitude to pursue tactics that advance the strategic aims of the Taliban. ISIL Khorasan are happy to claim attacks that entail gruesome civilian casualties. An attack of that kind may benefit the Taliban, but they don't want to be associated with it. The main risk of ISIL-K resurgence in the context of the Afghan peace process may lie in its ability to present itself as the only rejectionist terror group in the country and thus to attract new recruits and funding. Besides Al-Qaeda, the Taliban credibility, Taliban's credibility as a counter-terrorism partner for the international community will rest on its success in countering the threat from ISIL Khorasan. The number of foreign terrorist fighters in Afghanistan in search of livelihood and a purpose will render this a complex challenge, which will require careful monitoring as the peace process evolves. There are implications both for Afghan peace and of course for international counter-terrorism. The pessimistic take on the Taliban's approach is that it is slow rolling the peace process, avoiding significant compromises or irrevocable compromises, uh, and allowing the inherent complexities and difficulties of the issues to carry us into 2021 and ultimately beyond a point of no return for military options to oppose Taliban domination. Thus, it would hope to avoid difficult decisions and actions that alienate its hardline components and its allies and so maintain its internal discipline as well. There is a more optimistic analysis, though, based on early signs of Taliban efforts to enforce its will among non-Afghan fighters operating under its protection. It seems to be starting to address the thorny and divisive issue of registering, regulating and reining them in to ensure that they wage jihad in the form of training and military activity only in Afghanistan and under the Taliban flag. And indeed, there are some early reports from the fighting in, in Helmand province, which suggests that there is a, you know, that Al Qaeda is a, an active uh, partner of the Taliban in that particular current campaign. The main Taliban worry seems to revolve around the tribal Mahajirin and Mujahideen in the provinces bordering Pakistan, many of whom are loudly committed to global jihad. And this incipient approach is equally controversial within the Taliban with hardliners, uh, especially some of the commanders associated with the Haqqani network. There is obviously potential for division and conflict here, but it's too soon to say if and when it will reach that point. In closing, let me just say that the 1988 committee and the monitoring team seek to support the Afghan peace process. Um, the, the, in the end, the, the way that the sanctions regime evolved was that in 2011, uh, Resolution 1988 uh, separated out the sanctions regimes for, uh, for Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. And the thinking there, of course, was that Al-Qaeda was an irreconcilable terrorist group and the Taliban was to be uh, regarded as a potential uh, political force within Afghanistan, one that was currently uh, a threat to peace and security in Afghanistan, but which could be uh, at some point uh, successfully uh, brought into uh, a peace process. So that was, the, that's the, that was the whole point of that division that was made in 2011. So uh, the 1988 sanctions regime is all about peace and security in Afghanistan. And uh, it's become increasingly active uh, in the last couple of years because, precisely because of progress in the peace process. Um, and uh, some of the things which had previously been rather problematic in the sense of people um, uh, not really 
taking due account of uh, sanctions measures like the travel ban. Uh, these were increasingly being taken seriously and proper exemptions being sought and granted for Taliban negotiators. And this is all helpful because what it does is it starts to it starts to sort of um, to pass between uh, those Taliban who are actively engaged in a process seeking peace and uh, others who perhaps are not. Uh, and so um, it's going to be an interesting uh, progression now. We have, the Taliban, we have the Taliban travel ban exemptions. We also have the aspiration in the US Taliban agreement for the lifting of UN sanctions. Um, that's not, uh, as it seems to me, an immediate prospect, but of course, in the end, that's a matter for the Security Council. The Security Council will take that decision at some point or may take uh, interim decisions, which are more to do with um, uh, alleviating, adjusting, um, moderating the, uh, the sanctions regime uh, and indeed the details of uh, those who are sanctioned. So um, we very much have a part to play in uh, maintaining the momentum towards peace, in supporting and facilitating that peace, in encouraging member states, neighboring member states, to feel that they can play a constructive role. All of the neighboring countries, uh, other well-disposed um, uh, international players, um, all of whom should feel that they can work with the 1988 uh, committee and with the sanctions regime uh, in a constructive direction. And of course, uh, it is our uh, overwhelming hope that this will be successful. But we also believe that it is necessary to be uh, a very objective in our monitoring and our assessment of the Taliban uh, in order to ensure that they feel the pressure that perhaps is necessary uh, to ensure that they deliver on their part of the agreement. Thank you.